Hello and welcome to this fifth and final lecture as part of this series where we're going to join everything together and think about how we can use oxygen isotopes from carbonates from lake sediments in order to reconstruct past environmental change. So this is some carbonate that we can see actually forming in the lake waters. This is a lake I've worked on called Lake Nar in Turkey. So this is carbonate forming in the waters. And this is the car this carbonate will then fall out to the bottom of the lake and become part of the sediments at the bottom of the lake. So I've shown you pictures of lake sediment before. So this is it forming in the waters and yeah, it will fall out to the bottom and become part of the sediment at the bottom of the lake. So this is just like the cut the lime scale you'd get in your kettle or your coffee machine, but this is this is carbonate forming actually in, in a lake here. So this is um, calcium carbonate, so CaCO3. So it has oxygen in, and whether that oxygen is oxygen 18 or oxygen 16, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, if you measured all the um, oxygen, worked out what it was. Um, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 from all the oxygen you've got will vary depending on two key things, temperature of the water from which it forms and the oxygen isotope composition of the water from which it forms. So firstly, temperature. So the temperature effect for carbonates is for every degree centigrade of temperature increase, the delta 18 though, the oxygen isotope composition of the carbonate that forms from that water um, will be 0.24 per mil lower. Okay, so for every one degree C temperature increase, the delta 18 of the carbonate that forms from the waters will be 0.24 per mil lower. So that's the first effect. The second effect is the oxygen isotope composition of the water from which it is forming. Now that is influenced by the oxygen isotope composition of the water in the lake, that is influenced by the oxygen isotope composition of the input, the water that goes into the lake initially. So precipitation, and you, you saw in previous lecture, uh, what sort of things influence the oxygen isotope composition of precipitation. Um, but also once the water is in the lake, its oxygen isotope composition can be modified from what it was originally. Um, so, for instance, evaporation is what we're particularly thinking about here. Evaporation can significantly modify the oxygen isotope composition of the water. So we, we've, we've heard before about how um, when you have evaporation, you preferentially evaporate water with oxygen 16 in. So if you have loads of evaporation um, and it isn't, that water isn't replenished, then your lake water is going to become higher and higher in delta 18 o the delta 18 no number is going to go up and up and up, meaning um, you're getting more and more oxygen 18 accumulating in, in those waters relative to oxygen 16 compared to what it was um, originally. So that, that's particularly the case, the evaporation um, signal is particularly the case in closed lakes. So a closed lake, one where there's no significant outflow, um, acts, and the closed lake acts like a giant rain gauge. Um, so the lake level will go up if there's a moisture surplus and it will, the lake level will go down if there's a moisture deficit. So water, um, H2O and if this O um, has, is 16 O, that will be preferentially evaporated over water um, that has 18 O. So what that will mean, as, as I said a minute ago, is that if you have loads of evaporation in a closed lake, um, that means you will gradually increase the oxygen isotope composition of the lake water. The oxygen isotope, the delta 18 O value will go up and up and up um, because you're, you're evaporating lots of water. That's preferentially going to be water oxygen 16 in. So you're going to leave water preferentially oxygen 18 in, in, in the lake waters. Um, so yeah, because water oxygen 16 is preferentially evaporated, and uh, that means that when there's a lot of evaporation, limited retards, delta 18 over the lake water will increase. The, the value will go up. So yeah, in closed lakes, the effect of evaporation on delta 18 over the lake water is usually far greater than the other influences on delta 18 over the lake water and far greater than this direct temperature effect. 
as well. So this modification within the lake, which by which we really mean evaporation, so particularly interested in the precipitation evaporation ratio, this modification of delta rate no within lake is the key driver of delta rate no lake water and therefore delta rate no carbonate. That's far greater, in closed lakes, that's usually a far greater influence on delta rate no carbonate than the direct temperature effect or these other influences on delta rate no lake water. So an example of a closed lake is Lake Nar. Um, so this is a lake I've worked on in Turkey. So in the first lecture, I showed you the oxygen isotope record from lake sediments from Lake Nar. Um, so I showed you this graph um, and we talked about how it's a closed lake. So we, so we know that um, higher values means basically drier climate, lower values means wetter. Um, so really what we mean here is when it's drier, it means there's, there's a bit more evaporation and or less precipitation. Wetter means there's more precipitation and or less evaporation. Okay, so we can use the oxygen isotope values from the carbonate from the NAR lake sediments in order to reconstruct changes in the precipitation and evaporation ratio, so wet dry climate going back through time. So yeah, we, we knew that in, in particularly times in the late Holocene, it was quite dry, whereas in the early Holocene, it was, it was quite wet. Whereas in an open lake, so where there is some significant outflow, um, more of an open system, that's why it's called an open lake, obviously. Um, so yeah, there's inflow and outflow, keeps the waters fresher. Um, and this means that it, you haven't got that um, evaporation modification really of delta rate no lake water here. What, what here is influencing oxygen isotope composition of carbonate is the direct temperature effect, but also um, the oxygen isotope composition of the lake water, this time influenced by the oxygen isotope, isotope ratio of precipitation, which is influenced by the source of precipitation, temperature, type of precipitation, amount of precipitation, the things that we talked about in a previous lecture. So an example of an open lake is Lake Amersey in Germany. And this is um, the oxygen isotope record from the sediments of uh, Lake Amersey. Um, and um, yeah, whereas from Lake Nar, the oxygen isotope composition is allowing us to reconstruct changes between wet and dry in, term, in terms of climate going back through time. The record here, so this is the oxygen isotope record here, um, and from that, they are calculating temperature. So this time, the oxygen isotope composition, because um, it's an, an open lake, responding to something different. Um, so they are able to reconstruct, it's, it's responding to temperature. So they are able to reconstruct temperature um, from the oxygen isotope composition here. So allowing you to, it, it's, the oxygen isotopes are responding to a different thing in an open lake um, as they were in a closed lake. So that's, that's it quite simply. However, it's not quite as simple as that. So there are a few additional things to consider um, when you're analyzing carbonates from a lake sediment core. So firstly, there are actually different types of carbonate that form in lakes. And even if they form under exactly the same conditions, so from exactly the same lake water, delta 80 no, the temperature was the same, even if they do, they will have slightly different oxygen isotope compositions. So if you've got some calcite and aragonite forming from exactly the same water, exactly the same temperature, actually the resulting delta 80 no of that carbonate will be slightly different um, because of the way um, the, the carbonate forms. So for example, aragonite is 0.7 per mil more positive than calcite formed under exactly the same conditions. And there's other types of carbonate as well, which like dolomite, which will have be even more different um, than that 0.7 per mil difference between aragonite and calcite. So you need to take that into account. If you've got, particularly if you've got a lake core with calcite and aragonite, you need to correct for that difference um, before you can then go on and really properly consider whether your oxygen isotope record can then reconstruct temperature or evaporation or whatever. And secondly, um, what we call disequilibrium or vital effects. So in both organic carbonate and inorganic carbonate, so organic carbonate would be when you've got carbonate um, forming um, shells like ostracods, so organisms forming carbonate sh shells, 
or inorganic carbonate. So that carbonate that I showed you a picture of just precipitating in the lake waters in Lake Nar. And um, in both of these, um, they can precipitate what we call out of equilibrium. That's why it's called disequilibrium effects. So that just means giving delta H and O values different from what um, you would expect for the given delta H and O lake water and temperature from which they formed. Um, and then thirdly, in wash of detrital carbonates, so when you're analyzing a sediment core and using the delta H and O from a layer of carbonate of a known age to try and work out what the climate was like at that time, you're making the assumption that the carbonate that you're analyzing formed at that time, that that radiocarbon date or whatever has said that that age is. However, what might happen is you might get carbonate that formed, say, millions of years ago. Uh, it could be locked away in the catchment as, lime, as limestone, just as, an, as a rock exposure. Some of that might get eroded and washed into the lake and that gets deposited in the sediment and you're analysing that carbonate, but that carbonate didn't form at the time the rest of the sediment in that layer formed. It formed millions of years ago, it's just been washed in and incorporated into that layer of a much younger age. Um, <clears throat> so if you have carbonate in your catchment, if you do have, so some catchments won't have any limestone, um, any carbonate in at all, any limestone or whatever, but some catchments will and that might get um, erodes in. If you do have some of that in your catchment, um, then you need to take, you need to account for that. You there are various ways where you could maybe try and remove that from the sediment, or at least make some statistical calculations to correct for that. So yeah, it's not quite as simple um, as I outlined earlier. There's these things and more which you would need to consider to properly interpret the oxygen isotope record. <clears throat> so carbon isotopes. Um, from carbonates are often used as well to help interpret the oxygen isotope record. So the, the carbon isotopes are used on their own as an additional proxy, but also they are used in combination with oxygen isotopes to help interpret the oxygen isotope record. So because we're particularly focusing on oxygen isotopes in these lectures, I'm going to talk about this carbon isotopes from, from, from this perspective of helping us to interpret the oxygen isotope record. So they're particularly used, and this, you particularly look at whether there's a strong co-variation between delta H and O and delta 13 C um, back, back through time, and because that can allow you to establish whether or not the lake has remained closed. So you might go to a lake in the present day and you know the lake is closed now because there's no, you can see there's no outflow from that lake. Okay, but how do we know that's the case back through time? Um, how do we know this lake was closed 13, thousand years ago. Um, well, if, if there is a strong positive correlation, co-variation uh, between delta H and O and delta 13C, that suggests the lake has been subject to evaporation and has been remained closed and had a long residence time um, going back through the past. So yeah, if you, if you get evaporation, that raises the delta H and O values we've talked about. But what it will also do, um, if you've got a closed lake long residence time, the water sitting around for a long time. <clears throat> you get evaporation of the water, leading to higher oxygen isolate values, but also it means you've got time for outgassing of CO2 and preferentially the carbon that will leave the lake is carbon 12, um, not carbon 13, because it's lighter, like with the oxygen, like with the evaporation of oxygen in water. When you're outgassing carbon, you're more likely to lose the carbon 12 rather than the carbon 13. Um, so yeah, when, when you've got a closed lake, lots of evaporation, you know, higher delta A to no, at the same time, you're also likely to have high delta 13 C. So if you've got this strong correlation between delta A to no and delta 13 C going back through time, that would indicate that you've got a closed lake with a long residence time um, through your record. So yeah, this is, this is the record from Lake Nar, and it shows, yeah, generally when you've got higher delta A to no, you've got higher delta 13 C, a statistically strong relationship suggesting a closed basin hydrology throughout the record. Finally, just to say that ideally, we've just talked about oxygen isotopes here, but ideally we would never just want to use one proxy to reconstruct past climate, because there's so many things that could influence proxies. Um, you might think we might be fairly confident the oxygen isotopes are a strong proxy for wet-dry, 
the change in hydroclimate, that actually um, sometimes um, they will be responding to something else. There might be a time when they're responding more to a change in precipitation source. So the more proxies we have, like diatoms and pollen, um, X-ray scanning, eye track scanning these um, sediment cores alongside the isotopes, and that allows us to produce a more robust interpretation. Um, so yeah, we would we would really not want to just you. We can we can look at all these things, try and we can be fairly confident option isotopes are a proxy for evaporation or temperature. But we do we would want to have upper proxy records as well um, to get a much more robust interpretation. Okay, so this is the paper we're recommending that you read um, for looking at option isotopes in lake sediments. This is um, the best review out there um, of this. So we'd recommend you giving that a read. And then here are the summary questions. So as always, have a look through these. Can you answer these? Uh, if not, go back to the relevant slides um, and see if that helps. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you found these lectures very useful.